Brilliant. Excellent. Well, really, really good to see you all. Thanks everyone for coming and joining us. And uh, this is the, I think this is the third one we've done um, of these. And uh, yeah, just found them really super helpful with the various people we've had coming in and uh, just been great to see such consistency of people um, buying into them. And, and um, obviously the feedback that's been coming back as well has been really positive, hence why we've kept, kept them going. We won't run one in August. Um, so we're just obviously running this one now in July. Um, and then we're, we're kind of looking at some, I know we're talking lots in terms of some of the, the regional activity and things that we do and what that looks like as we come out of COVID and everything that's gone on with that and um, kind of probably keep some of this stuff going a little bit as well as we find a, a, a new rhythm. But it, it's really great to have um, Patrick Regan with us. And I'm going to ask Patrick in just a few moments to um, unmute himself, introduce himself um, to you. Many of you will, will have come across Patrick, I'm sure. Um, he was part of our, our ELS online program and just really just great to have his contribution. He attends in the in church as well. And so just really part of the conversation um, for us as a, as a movement. And so it's just a real delight to have him um, with us this morning. Patrick, so much for taking the time and making yourself available. I know you're a, you're a busy man. Um, but what I'd love to do, Patrick, I think obviously just for you to take a moment to introduce yourself um, and, and then, and then I would want to kind of just dive into this, this kind of whole subject that we want to just talk around this morning. Before we do that, let me just say what we'd love is for you to ask any questions you've got through this. And so as we have with all the previous Zooms, please use the chat bar that's at the bottom there. Um, and you can just submit your questions and uh, Sarah who's on on team here with us at LGCC she's going to just watch those questions and then she'll kind of put them together in themes and then and then kind of bring them um, a little bit later on and ask Patrick those questions on, on your behalf and then what we'd love to do after a time of Q&A is something we've not done before um, in terms of these zooms is get us all out into breakout rooms and just to pray for one another I think I don't know how many of you are feeling but the, the last kind of few months have been quite relentless, um, uh, certainly for, for me, and I'm sure they have been for, for many of you. And I think it'd be just a, a great opportunity as we gather in this forum, just to get into a breakout room with five or six of us and just pray God's best on one another, just pray some blessing over each other uh, in this season. Particularly, some of us will have an eye on a holiday, perhaps, or a bit of a downtime over August. Uh, and it'd be great just to pray just some refreshing prayers over, over one another as well. So that's our plan um, for this morning. Um, pa Patrick, um, like I said, great for you just to introduce yourself and, and um, particularly as well Kintsugi Ministry. Um, and, and also, I guess, what are some of the things that have really stood out to you um, right now when we, when we think particularly around just the, the well-being of, of those, in leadership, the, those in leadership positions? Yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much, um, Carl. And it's just so brilliant to be with you guys. Um, like Carl says, I'm a, a member of Life Church in Chelmsford, where God lives. And uh, it is just really, really good. Um, I grew up in Elam, actually. So um, Eric Hutchinson um, was my main man. And I think I see Tony Tween on there, who is an absolute legend. Um, and I knew Tony, I've known Tony since I was born. So um, I've got loads of love and admiration for him and Brenda. And uh, so I returned back to Elam three or four years ago um, to the church. I lived in London in Peckham um, for 25 years. And so I know everyone at my church really well who's over 90 and uh, who loved me on the way. Um, but I'm slowly getting to know some other people. Um, I would love to share just three things really with you guys. And uh, one is, uh, I think what really affects us is, is what's going on in our community at the moment. You know, Chronicles 12 verse 32 says, the men of Issachar understood the times and knew what Israel should do. And I think there's a real grappling as leaders. We've got to understand what's going on because um, it affects our well-being and it affects the well-being of those around us. And, uh, and then I want to talk a little bit into leaders' well-being as well. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but the United Nations recently acknowledged that COVID-19 um, is going to cause widespread psychological distress. And they also revealed last year that a person dies of a completed suicide every 40 seconds. And yet governments spend less than 1% of their budgets on mental health care. And I feel like there is a tsunami of mental health challenges coming towards us as a country. Um, I found it really interesting when the government changed their advice from stay indoors, which was very directive, to stay alert, things started to change. People's anxiety started to go up. 
Um, domestic violence, we know, is on the increase. One particular domestic violence um, charity said they've had a 400% increase in web traffic um, to their website. Um, I think there's a real challenge for us around inequality. Um, poor mental health is a symptom of poverty, it is also a cause of poverty. And I know that our heart in Kintsugi Hope is that we've got to work more together. We've got to lay down ego, we've got to lay down brands, we've got to work alongside churches. Um, we see three waves that are really starting to hit and uh, there's a little image that will come up here. Um, the first wave was really the physical health crisis that we're all very aware of. The second wave is the economic crisis. Um, most people say we're going to hit a recession at some point. And that will cause um, the third wave, which is a mental health crisis. Um, and we know there'll be no vaccine available for the effects of COVID-19 on mental health and poverty. And we need to grapple with these now. We know when we last went through recession, suicide rates went up, for instance. And I find that, I don't know if with you and with the people that you're trying to lead, is people can have a good day followed by a bad day, uh, a good hour followed by a bad hour. And I really feel that people are grieving at the moment. And uh, one illustration I've been using with lots of people is this uh, ball in the box. I'm sure you've seen this before. Um, grief is the ball and the ball is bouncing around that box and it's smashing into that pain button quite regularly and it's hurting. Um, what happens is, is the ball starts to get smaller over time, but it's still there. I think grief is less going through stages these days. I think modern day research says that actually grief is always there. And that could be the loss of a job, a loss of way of life. And the ball can get smaller, but it's still going to bounce around that box. And it's still going to smash into that pain button. And, uh, and that's what people are going for at the moment. They're going for this sort of roller coaster of emotions. A couple of years ago, me and my wife, Diane, um, who studied at KT, uh, coincidentally, um, in the School of Creative Ministries many years ago, um, we felt God was leading us to start a charity to deal with two big issues. And we had no idea how almost pathetic it would be. Um, social isolation and mental health. And we called it Kintsugi because Kintsugi is a Japanese word that means golden joinery. And if you break an object, um, you might be able to see this behind me here, this piece of art, is we tend to mend it with super glue. And what they do in Japan is they put a gold powder in it. So instead of hiding the cracks, they make a feature of the cracks. Arguably the object becomes more beautiful than it was before. And there's this firm belief that beauty comes out of brokenness, that our scars are not there to be ashamed of. Our scars make us who we are. And, uh, and I sort of feel like over the years, if I'm really honest with you, um, in the church, we've done well, we've grappled with issues of poverty and education, mental health, not so much though. Um, we've really had some interesting theology on it, and I think now we really do need to grapple with it and reset what we're thinking. Um, this afternoon, please don't display this until this afternoon, there's a survey that's going to come out in the press uh, from 625 churches who were asked this question. Looking ahead, the three months ahead, what do you think uh, the biggest needs in the community served by your church are likely to be as direct result of the coronavirus pandemic? And really interesting that out of the 650 to 25 churches, rather, loneliness and isolation, adult mental health and well-being, um, and the physical needs for those who are still at risk, vulnerable, older. The second question was, as a church, what are you going to do to serve your local community? And, uh, and again, really encouraging that churches are grappling with how do we communicate the love and compassion of Jesus to those who are lonely and isolated? Um, so what we did in Kintsugi Hope, we devised a 12-week program and uh, it's a bit like Alcoholics Anonymous, but for well-being and uh, looking at all the issues around well-being, anger, forgiveness, justice, um, all those different things that are so, so important. And really simply, because I know church leaders are shattered, um, we said, please don't start something else. You're exhausted, but maybe your small groups could do this for 12 weeks, but don't just do it for the people in your small group. Maybe ask your people in your small group to invite their neighbors and their friends and their families. Um, we've seen small groups treble in size over this period. We've seen non-Christians come in. Um, we have signed up a new partner church every single day since lockdown and it's become so missional. And I think this is where it, the church is at, is if you've got an illustration I'd like to use, if you've got cancer or you've got a friend who's got cancer, 
we would expect the medical professionals to give chemo, radiotherapy, medical help. Um, we can't do what they do. There's no way. We shouldn't even try. And I think it's the same with mental health, to be honest. Um, we can't muck around with this stuff. But to get through a cancer journey, you need community, support, love, family. And actually, that's where the church comes in. And it's the same with mental health. Um, doctors are saying to us, you know what, five minutes of us is not going to solve this issue. An hour's counselling, as fantastic as that could be, is not going to solve this issue. We need community. We need friendship. You need relationship. So I just sort of described the Kintsugi wellbeing groups as sort of Weight Watchers for Wellbeing. And uh, come together, get trained, train your church, get involved in reaching out um, to your community, but also to the people in your church that just need it at the moment. Um, when I'm thinking about leadership at this moment and I'm talking to leaders, most leaders I'm talking to are going, we are totally exhausted and there's part of us that don't want to go back to the way things were before. And, and I think we're at a fascinating stage where, um, you know, I've been praying this morning, actually, I've been reading Isaiah 58, which talks a lot around, um, you know, the king Citrus has allowed the people to go back from exile um, to Jerusalem and they come back to this place, uh, the ruins, and, uh, and they're getting distracted by why weren't things like they were before? You know, we're worshipping, we're fasting, we're doing all this stuff. And through the prophet Isaiah, God says, you know, the, the, the type of fasting I'm looking for is to break the chains of injustice. And, you know, the best thing you can do for your well-being, it says in verse nine, is, um, is to actually look at uh, looking after the poor and the marginalized. So how do we do that? How do we have that strategic conversation at the moment? Um, teams who seem to have been doing well are now starting to get a bit raggy with each other. I've, I've talked to many leaders that have said that. Um, if I'm honest, I think for many years in the UK, we've sometimes had a bit of an unhealthy leadership style where we have so many leaders that live on the verge of burnout. Um, I often say to people, I feel like, and this is me, you know, I get my phone and my phone works as well on 10% as it does 100%. It just doesn't last very long. And sometimes I feel like I rest because I'm recognizing I'm getting to the edge. And, but then my phone's got 10% again, so I'm ready to go. And I feel like if we're going to minister to our communities, you cannot give out of an empty cup. And, uh, and we need to grapple with this. I'm currently um, writing a new book on resilience. And uh, um, it's really interesting because I feel like that's what people need in this time going forward. Like resilience, by definition, is thriving in the midst of adversity. And, uh, and the traditional way of looking at resilience was bouncing back bouncing back to how life was and actually I'm not sure we will bounce back um, I feel like there's been stuff that's gone on um, there's people that we've lost there's things situations and and it's really interesting that all the modern day research on resilience said resilience is less than bouncing back but bouncing forward um, how do we take the stuff that has happened and make it be transformational so we bounce forward you know, Walter Brigham, the Old Testament prophet, in the uh, uh, Old Testament uh, scholar, says the role of the prophetic is to evoke grief at what is lost, but create amazement is what is possible. The life comes out of the ruins. Um, resilience for me is, and that's why I think our, we need to help our people be more resilient. We need to help our leaders become more resilient. I see it as a bit like sun cream. You know, um, you still feel the heat. But actually, there's a protective layer that means that you can survive and you can keep going. Um, Carl talked about um, asking me to talk about what are some of the things that we can safeguard ourselves as leaders? Um, what are the dangers at the moment of stress, anxiety? Um, and I, I think this is such an important issue to address because secondhand smoke is really real, isn't it? And secondhand smoke can still kill you. You know that. If you're in a pub years ago, that's why they banned secondhand smoke because you're breathing it in and and sometimes we might not be the ones suffering but there's so much suffering around us it can have an effect on us and i've got so many things i could say on this but just just some real couple thoughts of how we can survive as leaders um number one is we need to get rid of the shoulds the must the oughts <laughs> i should be able to cope i must pull myself together i ought to be stronger and, you know, we do it all the time. And I've got a great job. I've got a great church. I've got a great vibe. I'm not suffering like some other people are. I should, I must, I ought. 
you know, the really interesting thing is we need to accept our limitations. Um, I don't many hear many people preach about this. You know, I was part of the, the history maker generation. I don't know if you guys remember bouncing up and down to the delirious song, I'm going to be a history maker. I'm going to change the world. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do the other. Um, Peter Slazo, who wrote the book Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, says we find God's will in our lives, in our limitations. I'm not sure it's going to be a bestseller for me, my next book, except your limitations. Um, I'm not sure it's going to sell loads. But think about it. Our bodies are limited. Our minds are limited. Our IQs, our giftings. You know, I've got my lovely PA Jess doing the PowerPoint. She's brilliant at admin and creativity. Um, I am limited in that area. And I love other people who aren't. Um, our personality, our emotional wiring, our families, you know, our stage of life. You know, elderly parents, some of us got younger kids, um, our education, our careers, but God's call on our lives as well. And we are never designed to be superhuman. And like Paul's beautiful thing in jars of clay saying that actually those jars of clay that he talks about in Corinthians were designed to be vulnerable. They were designed to break so the light would shine through. And, and I think there's a resetting of values that needs to go on where the weak will become strong. And actually, we will see life come through the ruins, but it's not going to be by gritting our teeth. You know, Brené Brown says courage and vulnerability are the same thing. The Latin word for courage is cur. It means to speak your mind with your heart. There's a new type of stuff that's coming out here. Um, we are interconnected, and, uh, but I feel like we need to learn to be so much more interdependent. And one of the beautiful things about something like Elam it's that you are a movement, we are a movement, that we can rely on each other. We are not a church on our own, somewhere in a community. And how can we serve? How can I serve you guys? How can we serve and love and support each other through this time? Um, second thing, really quickly, um, boundaries. Now, the research on this is fascinating. Um, the most compassionate people in the world are the most boundary people in the world. Now, I never used to think that. I used to think the most compassionate people in the world were those that just worked 24-7 because they just loved everyone. You know, a bit like Mother Teresa. Um, the fact is, Mother Teresa was incredibly boundaried. She would not start without prayer um, for hours. And uh, Brené Brown has done some brilliant research on this. says, compassionate people ask for what they need. They say no when they, when they need to. And they say, when they say yes, they mean it. They're compassionate because their boundaries keep them out of resentment. Brené Brown um, approached a load of church leaders, actually, clergy, and she asked them, do you think the people in your congregation um, are doing the best they can? Um, and it was a 50-50 split. 50% said yes, 50% said no. And, uh, and Brené Brown said to her husband, you know, um, what do you think? And he said this, I'm not sure, but I know that I'm happier and my life is better when I believe they are. People often are assumed the best. You know, the famous verses in Matthew, we've got to find godly rhythms. You know, um, Matthew, uh, uh, let me, um, Matthew 11, isn't it? Yes, it, 28, 30. Are you tired, worn out, burn out in religion? Come to me, get away with me and you'll recover your life. I have to take you how to show a real rest. Walk with me, work with me, watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and learn to live freely and lightly. What are those rhythms of grace that we need? You cannot give out of an empty cup. Um, Self-compassion, and I, I please, please hear this because I wish this was preached on when I was younger. Self-compassion and self-indulgence are two different things. Um, as a bloke, I used to think self-compassion was bubble bath and candles, and I weren't really up for it, to be honest. Um, but I realised that actually self-compassion takes discipline. Personally, I will not start work without doing 400 steps. Um, I've got my Fitbit on, because I know that I need that exercise in the morning to get my brain going, to actually put that rhythm into my life. Um, what are the rhythms that we need to put into our life at the moment? Self-compassion is this, it's talking to yourself the way that you would talk to your best friend. Um, how do you, would you talk to your best friend with kindness and gentleness? Guys, you are doing so well. Zoom preaching, is exhausting. It is the most sterile thing, isn't it? You preach your heart out. Um, and normally, most of us communicators, we get energy of people. And it's just reality. We love hearing people laugh or cry or smile. To be honest, breathing would be good now. Anything, you know. And the reality is you put your laptop down and you're shattered. 
Um, and uh, you are doing so, so well. Last thing, and then I'll shut up, I promise, um, is the famous quote from Dallas Willard to John Alberg when John Alberg said to him, how do we, you know, how do I grow spiritually? Dallas Willard said, the thing you need to do is that you need to realize that hurry is the greatest enemy of your spiritual life in our day. You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. Oh my goodness. I have four children, just so you know. And, uh, and like I said, we've signed up a different partner church every single day. It is not easy. It is not easy. But I'm starting to realize there is a real difference between hurry and busyness. And actually, busyness is okay. We're designed to be busy. But hurry is that sense of always being on edge. Um, it's interesting, isn't it? They say, the stats say, iPhone users touch his or her iPhone 262,617 times a day. So each iPhone user is on average uh, on their phone two and a half hours a day, 76 sessions. And I can always tell when I'm preaching in front of a church leader or a movement leader, because they always sit on the back on their iPhone nine times out of 10 doing work, doing emails um, until I point it out, which is not always uh, goes down that well. Um, but you know what? The thing is, the, the secret to happiness, John Mark Cromer says this, is that we've got to be present to the moment. What is God doing now? A really interesting question we've been asking ourselves as a team, what does success look like in this time? And I know sometimes we get nervous about talking about success, but I think it's about living in line with our values, our kingdom values. Seek first the kingdom and all these things will be added unto you. Um, so guys, I want to encourage you. I know I've said a lot. Um, things that we're doing, if Kintsugi Hope can encourage you um, by getting members of your church trained to run wellbeing groups, we would love to do that. The other thing I've done is I've um, produced um, some 12 minute talks. So um, you can people can use those during the summer. So take some time off. Um, they're quite well produced. We filmed them down at Live Church in Chumpstead. Um, try and take two weeks off. The first week, you're probably going to feel rubbish, to be honest. Um, that's the way it works. And the second week, you'll start to recover. But please, please don't just take one week off. Try and take two weeks off. Um, try and uh, realize um, the love that is out there for you guys and realize that beauty does come out of brokenness. And uh, we would love to serve. We'd love to help you guys. And uh, that's me done. Brilliant. Thank, thanks so much, um, Patrick. And um, I, I wonder if I could just ask you a question, just I guess just to push on this a little bit more. And, and, and um, you know, for, for everyone, we've, um, we've allocated the next 15 minutes, really, for, for any questions that you might want to put to to Patrick. Um, so please, you know, if there's stuff that you'd just love to ask, stick it in the comments bar. We'd love just to kind of put some of those questions to, to Patrick now, because I think there, there are stuff that is unique for us as church leaders that we have been journeying through that really would be great just to, to touch on naturally probably the question you want to ask is going to be really relevant to a whole bunch of other leaders who are who are in on this call or may listen to this um, recording on youtube in, in a few days time but perhaps patrick why don't you give a bit more time for some of those questions to come in could could i just ask you for you know oh, oh, being honest you know i think the last the last few months you know there's been a lot of um um, I think we can often do very well in crisis as church leaders. We can respond to crisis and we can kind of find a way, way through that. I found for me personally that probably the last couple of weeks is almost like I've hit a bit of a, a bit of a wall with some of that. So even like productivity and um, it's kind of hit a bit of a wall capacity feels like it's hit a little bit of a wall. All those yeah. are signs for, for I guess needing a bit of a break and some, some time out that many of us in this room will be feeling. What, what would you say to any leaders listening to this right now that actually find themselves really just on that? You, they've heard the safeguards that you've shared, but actually right now they're on the edge. <laughs> they, they kind of feel they're so close to that burnout. The stress feels high. Anxiety feels high. Even just if, an, if another kind of request came in, it would almost tip them. What would you say just by way of encouragement to them um, right now who are perhaps listening or may listen over the next few days? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think, I think really what I said about boundaries is so important. Um, what is okay and what is not okay for you guys? And, and I think everyone sets their boundaries quite differently. Um, I think if you're on the edge, you know, the fact is you need to stop um, and you need to pull back and you need to rest. Um, but I think also we need to make sure that we, I think, like I said, I think so often what happens is people get to the edge, they take a couple of steps back 
and then they go to the edge again and they live their life in that sort of scenario. And so I think this is a bit of a resetting of the culture of how we lead, if I'm honest. Um, if you define culture as the way we do things around here, um, I'm guessing every church has a culture. I guess Elam has a culture. Um, and it's like, what does that culture need to look like going forward? Because you can rest, and I think you need to rest over the summer. Um, but I, I don't think this is going to go away. You know, there may be a second wave. There may be some other things coming towards us. And, uh, and so if we're going to be really resilient, thriving in the midst of adversity, we need to have a little bit of a conversation around a culture shift um, so that we can last the long haul um, going forward. And, uh, and I think that comes through self-awareness, you know, accepting your limitations. Um, I mentioned that as well. And, uh, and just having good, godly people, you know, um, I would say to every leader, make sure, you know, we talk about prayer triplets. Um, so I can't get, I, every leader should be in a prayer triplet. We should be in a little, an accountability thing where we're regularly praying and speaking prophetically into each other's lives. Um, you know, for me, um, many of you will know Mark Pugh from uh, Riverside and there's five of us. We go away every three months and um, have 24 hours building rhythms into our lives um, and to pray, to prophesy and to really get a grip with um, what God's saying to us. So I think if you're on the edge, you need to step back. You need to get team around you. Um, and uh, But I think it, there's a long term view, Carl, as well. that I think you need to start thinking through. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Patrick. And I think just for, for, for me to say as well to anybody who maybe listens to this is, is talk to your area pastor. If you don't know who your area pastor is, then get in touch with myself or David Redbond and we'll be able to make sure you get in touch with them and, and you know, have a conversation with them if you just want that space to be able to, to talk to someone. Yeah, I think the other thing I would say, and I think I struggle with this a little bit, I know we're all motivated differently. I'm very need motivated and some people are very task motivated. Again, um, just working out what motivates you is really important. But I sort of feel like I need to keep coming back to the fact that you know, there is so much pain in our community. The emails I get sent on a daily basis is unbelievable. And um, the brokenness that is out there. But it's constantly, isn't it, that we are not the rescuer. Jesus is. And I think sometimes as leaders, I have a tendency, if you're not careful, you become a sponge um, for everyone's pain. And you don't mean to be, but you're shattered most of the time. And you haven't got that resilience, um, particularly when you're tired. And I think I'm constantly coming back going, Jesus, you are the rescuer. And uh, a bit like the people that brought the paralytic, I can do into Jesus' presence. I can bring people into your presence, but I can't rescue them. And I think sometimes there's a bit of a shift that we need to remember that over this period. Yeah, very good. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Patrick. Sarah, I think we've had some questions come in. Yeah, I think just around the whole boundaries and uh, I think, you know, in, in the relentlessness of suffering, you know, how, have you got any top tips for how to set good boundaries in the midst of like that kind of sense of busyness and, and how to kind of keep those boundaries in place? And then I think tagging on to that, I think someone was asking um, about uh, the book Boundaries, obviously by Cloud and Townsend and, and how, what you thought of that and is that a good place to start? So. Yeah, yeah, no, good place, good place. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think it does work out differently to your personality because um, you know, for some people, sitting down reading um, it might be um, hell. Um, for other people, it gives life, you know. Um, and so, but they often talk about the five paths to well-being and uh, talking about, you know, how active are we? How do we put things in our lives which we make sure we are active? Um, how mindful are we in terms of, are we taking notice of the negativity that comes in? And, you know, there's a lot of being said about, um, you know, mindfulness, I guess. And I think it's been misunderstood. I think mindfulness in the context of prayer is about one of the most useful things you could do because actually it's about allowing thoughts to go. You know, I always say my friend, Will Vanderhart uses this illustration that you imagine thoughts of trains coming into a train station. Um, you can, Get yourself worked up going i'm not going to let that train come into a train station you can even say train i'm going to rebuke you in the name of jesus on the underground it's going to come no matter what you do um but maybe it's choosing whether to get on that train or not and that's that's how taking captive every thought is actually all about it's about allowing the train to go and uh, so being mindful about what we're doing um connection who you're connecting with um you know who are those people in your life that are speaking into you um how does that look and, and I think it works for different people. You know, for me, date night, absolutely non-negotiable. 
Um, I think we've got to invest in our marriages. We've got to invest in those sort of things. And we all know this stuff, but the reality is when we're under pressure, we let it slip. Um, you know, um, control freaks. Some of us that like to keep control of everything. We've got to start letting go. Um, we've got to allow people to make mistakes. Um, and uh, so I think for everyone, it's going to look different. But I think it's asking that question, what makes you come alive? What makes you come alive? And you need to not give out of an empty cup. And, uh, and you know, I think the challenge from working at home, there's no transition time. Um, so you need to put a boundary in a transition time. So sometimes when I'm working at home, I'll go and walk around the block and then I'm back home. And then that's my transition time because I can't get in. Well, I'm in the office now. I couldn't get into the office before. Um, so you need that transition time. You need, I am now off. Um, some of us are allergic to turning our emails off. Um, and, uh, and sometimes we have to, um, because we can't, our brains cannot keep functioning the way that it's functioning. And, uh, and I know we want to help and I'm the worst at this. So I'm not speaking about it as an expert at all. Um, cause I, I'm motivated to help. Um, so yeah, so I think it just looks very different to very different people, but there's some good principle stuff you can take from that. I think. That's really helpful. And then I think there was a couple of questions around um, how does a partnership with you uh, as an organisation work? What's the commitment from churches? And, and you, I wonder if you've got a minute just to share about that as well. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, it's really, really simple, actually. Um, so the 12 week programme is um, is all online. So what happens is, is um, churches nominate some small group leaders uh we have to take up references and check safeguarding um it, it's a bit of a pain but it, we we've gone through so many um things to make sure it's really tight when it comes to safeguarding and um and i've been amazed actually how many churches don't have their safeguarding in order um but really tight on that um people apply um they then do the training online it's 20 nine minute sessions so it can be done in your own time it can be done over a number of weeks uh, and then what happens is, which I think is really lovely, is then you get access to a private Facebook group and each of the 12 weeks, um, my wife Diane teaches you how to do it. And it's done in learning styles. So each subject is written in seven different learning styles. So it's not like something you go through. Um, it's like take anger, for instance, there'll be, you know, depending on what research, there are seven different styles we learn in. Often in the church, we probably use three or four. Um, so there's creative activities, there's videos, there's discussion questions. If I'm doing it with a bl bunch of blokes down the pub, which I'm hoping to do um, in, uh, next year, is uh, I probably wouldn't use all the creative stuff. I might do, you know. Um, and so you sort of take it, I see it more of a buffet rather than a set menu. Um, you take what's appropriate to your context and then you deliver that um and you're good to go most of the groups are happening on zoom there's some happening in gardens there's some happening in pubs there's some happening in parks um we've heard stories of farmers doing it in farmers markets because there's suicide rates amongst farmers is high we've had stories of ladies who've been going through postnatal depression um, the church don't offer that much one in five ladies suffer from postnatal depression um they've been doing it um, we've also had stories of police doing it. Um, Tony Britton, who many of you may know from Braintree Elam, um, he's been running it with police all over the country. Um, just beautiful. Um, so yeah, so um, there's no fixed financial cost. We just ask at the moment, if you can make a donation, that would be great for us because we're a charity, um, but we don't want that to restrict anyone doing it. So if you go to groups at kintsugihope.com, uh, or look at the website, all the stuff is there. Um, yeah, and most people are training now, ready for September, to be honest, yeah. Brilliant, thanks so much, um, Patrick. And for those who want more information about that, Jess has put in the comments the, the link there um, to, to Kintsugi Hope and the group page that Patrick was talking about. So you can go and go and get access um, to, to that. Um, there's, there's no other kind of questions that have come in that haven't really been already touched on. And, and so, what we'd really love to do now is is just take an opportunity to to pray together as, as as church leaders and and i think you know together we we uniquely understand what each of us have journeyed over the last few months of lots of the the kind of things that we're involved in right now and um, many of us are knee deep in 
assessments, risk assessments, and other different things, and the challenges around gathering and regathering people. What does that What does that look like? And th this can kind of just add a whole load of different things for us, and pressures, and external pressures. And I think it'd be really great just to get into some rooms and just just spend a bit of time. If you don't know the person you're in a room with, and um, there'll be there'll be about four or five of you in a room together. If you don't know the people in the room, just introduce yourself, where you're from. Take a minute to do that. And uh, we'll keep this going till probably about five to 11. So I'll, I'll give you a couple of minutes warning, but it gives a good 15, 20 minutes just to pray for one another and just to, to take that time. So I'm going to open the, the rooms up right now. Brilliant. Thanks. Um, thanks, everyone. I think just um, as we come to a close, I think just to show our appreciation to, uh, to Patrick. I don't know if Patrick's still, still on here. I can't quite see him um, or whether he's gone. But Patrick, if you're, if you're still on the call, just a massive thank you to you for your time. And yeah, really, really, really appreciate it. And, and thanks everyone for coming and joining. I hope you found that beneficial. And I think really just, just keep talking to one another, keep reaching out. One of the things that oft a lot of um, different leaders have been saying, particularly around the Met regions, is actually in this season that the, the, um, the Met region has felt a lot closer, uh, a lot more connected. And that's just been really good to hear some of those things. And hopefully that will encourage us just to keep talking to one another, pick up the phone and and do and uh, yeah just keep keep talking to one another really one more thing i'm gonna just see if dave campbell wants to say any any last words and that is um there's a few things that have come out recently i want to just draw your attention to one was um the last sunday in august which is the bank holiday weekend um as river camp we're, we're putting together like a river camp sunday uh which is really just as a, a way of giving you an opportunity to have a sunday off if you're interested in that and um, dave's going to be doing a a talk or Elam Sound Leading Worship as part of that. And um, then the link for that to sign up for those details are is in the comments bar. So you can pick that up. But also I know just over the last few days, Elam have um, sent out an email about Elam Summertime, which is just a great opportunity as well. If you've got tech teams that need a bit of a downtime or worship teams that need a bit, a bit of time out, uh, or even yourself in terms of speaking, preaching, that sort of thing, then you can take advantage of, of some of those things as well. So so pick that information up. Uh, and make use of it as you, as you want to. Dave, do you? I can't see you, Dave, but do you want to say anything else before we before we close? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here somewhere. There he is. I don't know where I'm going to come up. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Carl, for organising all this. I just want a couple of things to say. To do sort of try and make use of that um, weekend, the end of bank holiday weekend, because I think we've got more than 50 odd churches uh, already sort of taking that. So, um, it's quite popular, so I'd have, have a go at that. I'll try and get, I may get a new joke for that. I'm not sure how high to set the expectations for that, but I'm trying to do something good. Uh, and also, thank you for your patience with risk assessments. I don't, I haven't had anybody write and say, I'm really enjoying this. I think this is wonderful. So uh, be careful. It's really hard going. We've not, we've not walked this path before. And so um, be super nice to one another when we're sort of trying to do it. So thank you. We just have to keep doing it. And last to say that I, I've, I've got a little blog come. I don't know what you call it. Video thing. The, um, pastoral five, six minute video coming out to you hopefully this week. Just about boundaries. Just about um, looking after yourself and your families. And so th thank your families. Thank you all. And, 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 and here the word that keeps coming out. You need, really need to take quality time to yourself. You need to take slightly more than you think you need. So if you take a bit more than you think you need, then err on that side. And I love you all. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, everyone. God bless you. Pray you have a great rest of the day, week, summer. See you again um, real soon. Bless you all. Thank you.